This playlist collects and organizes the segments of the lecture covering the Marquis article on abortion. We'll start off by talking a little bit about who Dr. Marquis is. Then we'll talk about his response to the Thompson article. Then we'll discuss why he rejects what he calls a biological criterion for right to life. Uh, specifically, he'll reject what he calls a genetic-based or human-based anti-abortion argument as too weak. And he'll also reject a pro-choice personhood argument for abortion as too strong. And then he'll present his own view, a future like ours account that purports to explain why killing is wrong. And then he'll try to both defend that position against criticisms and to support that position by uh, claiming that it helps to explain a number of different aspects of our pre-theoretic thinking about what makes killing wrong. So this is Dr. Donald Marquis. He was born in 1935. He received a BS in anatomy and physiology from Indiana University in 1957, and an MA in history from the University of Pittsburgh in 1964. And he earned an MA from the, in the history and philosophy of science from Indiana in 1964, and a PhD in philosophy in 1970. He is a professor of philosophy at the University of Indiana, and his specialties are ethics and medical ethics. Now, the argument of this essay is an attempt to establish that abortion is wrong for the same reason as killing the reader of this essay is wrong. Specifically, Marquis is going to reject both what he labels the standard anti-abortion and what he labels the standard pro-choice arguments in favor of his own argument that it is wrong to deprive someone of what he calls a future like ours. So he starts off by discussing why he thinks that Judith Jarvis Thompson's arguments that abortion is in at least some cases morally permissible. And he rejects these arguments because he thinks that they don't establish that a woman's right to control her body is not overridden by a right to life of the fetus. Thus, the moral status of abortion, he claims, is dependent upon the fetus having or lacking a right to life. Now, if you read through this section of the paper, it's not clear that the motivation here is particularly fantastic. He doesn't claim that Thompson clearly fails to show that it's not morally impermissible to get an abortion or that it's morally permissible to get an abortion. Instead, what he claims is that the right to life and the right to privacy as a sort of are adopted by pro and anti-abortion arguments don't reach a decisive victory. So in this way, it's a little bit strange to see him after he rejects this idea that the right to life clearly overrides Thompson's argument from the right to privacy, to then see him saying that he wants to now argue for a right to life. So I think the best way to understand this view is that he wants to try and argue for a right to life that he thinks presumptively overrides a right to privacy. Now, he doesn't actually defend that anywhere. And so it's a bit of a stretch as an interpretation of, of Marquis. But if we don't interpret it in this way, it does seem sort of strange for him to argue that the debate based on right to life versus right to privacy is a sort of scotch or undecided battleground 
and then argue that he wants to establish a right to life as the basis for arguing against abortion. So he gives us some sort of very quick versions of anti-abortion arguments and pro-choice arguments. So he says, uh, anti-abortion arguments, positions uh, against abortion tend to equate the right to life with being a member of the human race. And so he summarizes them in a quick argument that asserts humans have a right to life, fetuses are biologically human, hence fetuses have a right to life. But he says that biological humanity includes too much. That is, it seems to confer a right to life to uh, more creatures than just human fetuses. And so to illustrate this point, he notes that human cancer cell cultures are biologically human, but no one supposes that their biologically human origins give them any right to life. He also suggests that this premise is subject to moral relevance problems. So he says, the idea that just being a biological member of the human species provides you with the right to life, he thinks, requires that you be able to establish some connection between the biological facts and the moral facts. And he thinks that uh, these anti-abortion arguments merely assume this connection, that they don't really do a good job of establishing it. And he suggests further that it's hard to think of a good argument for such a connection. Now, one argument that one might offer for such a connection would be to note some of the qualities that human beings have in virtue of which it seems like they have intrinsic value or they could be treated or should be treated as an end of themselves. And this is the pro-abortion argument. Right? It argues that only persons have a right to life. And it says persons must be rational, communicate in complex ways, and possess a concept of a continuous self. Now, the specific criterion that he lists uh, aren't necessary to the argument. But the idea is that to be a person on this view, you have to have a sufficient uh, amount of higher cognitive functioning to discriminate you from, uh, say, for instance, snails or, uh, say, um, other animals like cows that we don't normally consider to have a right to life. And so to do so, usually people cite things like uh, being rational, being able to communicate specifically, communicate linguistically, possessing a concept of a continuous self. These are the sorts of things that people normally cite about human beings that are different or differentiate human beings from other animals, even other animals that have some higher cognitive functions. Fetuses are not persons by this criterion, so the argument goes. Fetuses don't really exhibit uh, rational behaviors. They don't communicate in complex linguistic ways, and they don't possess a concept of a continuous self. And for these reasons, then, criteria that would differentiate persons from other animals seem not to encompass fetuses. And if personhood is considered to be the minimum requirement for a guarantee of a right to life, then fetuses not meeting those criterion would deprive them of a right to life. And that's what the argument uh, would conclude, hence fetuses do not have a right to life. So he's rejected the uh, clash of duties or rights, the balancing of the right to privacy against the right to life approach that we saw in Thompson. And he's rejected what he considers to be or characterizes as the standard pro and anti-abortion arguments that focus on arguing that a fetus has or fails to have a right to life. <laughs>